And we were going to go to Exodus chapter 14 this time. We're kind of jumping ahead for a moment in the storyline of the Exodus um, with purpose. However, there are some major, major things in the Passover and the Exodus um, prior to this that are very, very important. For example, <clears throat> for example, if you study um, <clears throat> if you study the Old Testament, whether that's the prophets or the historical books or wherever, and you want to find the seminal place that deals with the primary sacrifice that they all refer to, we're talking about Old Testament all the way to Malachi, um, the story that you might think would be the most important would be Abraham offering his son Isaac. However, that story is hardly mentioned at all. The seminal, the, the, the focal uh, sacrifice that's always referred back to is the Passover, is the Passover. Now, I don't know about you, but I found that extremely significant. I certainly would have thought, and I know that in the New Testament, Paul refers back a lot to Abraham <clears throat> and to Isaac. But when it comes to the Old Testament, it's saying this story is the foundational story of the nation of Israel. It is the foundational uh, first feast and it is the sacrifice primarily that the prophets, and I'll just say it to you like this, that the prophets go back to and say, you failed here in Exodus 12. This is where you missed the meaning. All right, so I say all that to say I cannot express the extreme importance of um, of us taking time to go through Exodus 12, actually before that, but Exodus 12 is the primary place that mentions it. Uh, and it goes all the way through after uh, 14 even. Um, but tonight we're going to start in Exodus 14, and we're going to talk about the Red Sea. So we're jumping ahead of all the things that I just mentioned but uh, we're doing it with, with purpose, okay? So Exodus 14, uh, verse 13, <clears throat> and verse 14. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Um, how many of you are familiar with these verses enough that maybe you've even stood on them at a certain time in your walk where it was like, that's, I'm, that's where I'm, you know, I need that right there. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> they are great words. They are very popular Christian advice. They are uh, on pictures and posters you can go to many of the Christian bookstores and you'll see um, these words, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Uh, the Lord will fight for you. <clears throat> um, but the question is, is this what God wants? We say, well, it's in the Bible, so we know it's what he wants. Well, that's not necessarily true. Um, and um, 
on these most popular scriptures have we understood what's going on and what's being said. All right, so one reason why I'm bringing this up now and I'm pointing to this is that folks, we think we know the Bible and we don't. I mean, I'm including myself. Uh, we got into Exodus um, 12 and we found that there were two groups that came out of, of Egypt, the firstborns that were redeemed by the Lamb, and Israel, who was saved from bondage. It's there. It's literal. It's, you don't even have to interpret any, anything spiritual in the two groups. Just read the scriptures, and it says that. And yet, from top to bottom, the people that I've talked to about it, the people that know more, much more than I do, <clears throat> they never saw it either. They never saw it either. And what it tells me is that I need the Holy Spirit more than ever. And it tells me maybe the Lord is moving into a new phase with us where he is going, that where the dove wants to start going, okay, you think you know this. You don't know this. And uh, so my question is, are you open? Because uh, it's not me doing it. I'm, I'm in the midst of this myself. But it is... It, it will take a humbling of our precious depths and say, maybe we don't really see what's going on here. Maybe we've never understood the Passover at all. And Lord, if we've never understood the Passover, maybe we've never understood the Lord's Supper since the Passover and the Lord's Supper were meant to be the same thing. And maybe we've understood certain special things to that but we never really saw what was in his heart. And I'm telling you, <clears throat> only when we change our view and our ways from our heart to his, from our understanding to his, from when we, can I say it, when we become Bible school students again, <laughs> you know, oh no, uh, actually this would be sitting at the feet of the Holy Spirit and sitting at the feet of Jesus and letting him See, see, Jesus doesn't give interpretations of the scripture. They are him. They, are, they declare him. That's what the, Jesus said in John 5, 39. Search the scriptures because you think you're going to find life by getting in there and finding stuff. And he says, they are they which testify of me, and you won't come to me that you might have life. You're coming to the scriptures that you might have life. That's what he said there in John 5.30. But you're not coming to me. And um, so, um, you know, it's just humbling over and over when you go through the scriptures and then the Lord says, well, you remember how everybody taught that and you agreed with it? <laughs> well, it's not right. And you go, I need to hear from God from now on. I need to hear from God from now on. Okay, so... Um, in Exodus 14, let's go back to verse 11 and then, uh, and then read down through 14. <clears throat> this is the people. And you remember what the situation was, don't you? They had left uh, Ramses. They had got to the Red Sea. There was a mountain on this side. There was a mountain on this side. The Red Sea was here. And Pharaoh's army were bearing down on them. And so the people are freaking out. And here in verse 11, and they say, said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? Now remember, God had showed up after 400 years, and he said, let my firstborn go, that he may serve me. And he, he, he repeated that in several different manners, let my people go, that they may serve me in sacrifice, let my people go, that they may have a feast with me. All of that pointing to, um, if you remember the prodigal son story and the exact thing that had happened there, God wanted the father wanted for the prodigal to let his firstborn, not the prodigal, not the elder, 
but the invisible son. Let him go. You remember that? I mean, I, I feel like it's for some reason I have to repeat now a little bit. But um, so the prodigal comes back and he's, he's more broken. He's open. But that doesn't, that doesn't count as, as the son, as the firstborn. But that does count. It does count. Brokenness does count for the Holy Spirit to begin to reveal the firstborn in us. So you know, you know the basic story that I've told there, that the, that, the, that the Father begins to put the ring on and begins to do all of these things, and he begins to, to um, uh, do that in a different spirit than you're forgiven or whatever, and the Son is looking into his face, and he's looking at these tokens and, and he can receive those tokens in any number of ways. The tokens, the ring, the, 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 the robe, the shoes, all of that can be misinterpreted, but the Father's face cannot be misinterpreted. I'm telling you. And he's looking and he's going, there is some, he's seeing somebody other than me. He is treating me like this other son, this other person. And still he doesn't get it until he, the father takes him to the altar. And as I said before, the prodigal son story doesn't say anything about an altar, but every story, and I mean over and over, I can give you 15 just quickly, story proves out the prodigal son story. It's a clear cut pattern. He takes him to the altar and he takes the fatted calf and, and he says, son, this is it. This is what it's about. And he takes that knife and he says, you, you've been surfaced. You've been on the uh, looking at everything out here. I want you to see the inward parts. I want you to understand who we are. This is who we are. This is our life. Blood flowing down and, and sacrifice. And he's lifting it up, you know, and he's saying, this is, this is our life. This is who you were supposed to be. And the prodigal is looking at the father's face. He's saying, I've never seen him like this, but it's the father and it's always been his father and he never saw his father in the father's element. He's seen him through his own understanding of what a father's supposed to be and what this family is all about. And when he took all of that inheritance, he showed that he didn't have the family spirit but the father saying, this is our family spirit. This is us. This is us. And the prodigal's looking at him and he's looking at his hands and he's looking at the, and it's there. It's there. Not with the, the tokens that could be misread in a million ways. Flesh could rise up. But it's there that the firstborn comes forth. It's there that the firstborn is revealed. It's there that the hidden son, the invisible son, now is made manifest. And then the father says, now we eat it. Let us eat this. This is our food. This is what we live on. And when they ate it, the feast began. Okay. So, this is this is exactly what's going on in the Exodus. God is saying, let my firstborn son go. Let him go, just like prodigal son, let him go out of you. Israel, let him go out of you. Not just Egypt, let him go out of Egypt. Yes, because that's part of the process. But let him go out of you. Okay, so, so they are, um, Complaining, they have a different spirit. Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? Thinking of self, protecting self, always protecting self, always covering up, always uh, wanting God to move in a way that will suit them. And I'm just here to tell you that God doesn't exist 
to suit us. He exists in our lives to bring forth this precious son. Okay? So, to serve the Egyptians, that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again, no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. So, what are they doing? They're freaking out. They're in this situation. They are... And what situation is it? It is a situation of the eyes for them. It's a situation of the eyes. They see a mountain here. They see a mountain here. They see a Red Sea here. And they see Pharaoh bearing, bearing down on them. And it's only a situation of their eyes. It's not a situation of the Lord. It's not a situation of clarity. It's not a situation of eternity. It is a situation of just flat out living in this earth like, like people who are not born again and seeing what they would see and responding with internal reactions the way they would respond. They have no clue what has just happened. They have no clue of the Passover. They have no clue of the events that have gone before them except that they were told, tell the story to your children. And they're just telling the deliverance story. Besides, only the firstborn, only the firstborn would see it differently anyway. All right, so what is that saying to us? I mean, I mean, let's just get real and da da da. What's that saying? If that's really the case, and it really is the case, two groups came out, it's saying that maybe we're in the group of Israel and not the firstborns. Maybe we're, you know, we got redeemed, as it were, from bondage, saved from bondage, but we're not with, we're not, it's not the firstborn, it's not his firstborn son in us, it's us, it's God. God deliver me, God save me, God do this and that. Okay, well, you know, that may not bother some people, but that bothers me, not just for me, but for you, if that's really the case, and it really is the case, that we discover the firstborn for the heart of the Father, if for no other reason. Or we, you know, you could say uh, that we discover the firstborn so we're not freaking out all the time. But if that's the goal, you'll never discover him. There has to be a willingness for death, the firstborn, the death of the firstborn. And then there has to be a genuine lamb that saved you. A genuine lamb that saved you. And the salvation isn't as simple as it sounds because it involves a slain lamb that redeemed them and it involves eating a lamb that becomes your resurrection. That's how you get out of Egypt. That is your, re Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. That's him, that's him, that's him. And that's him being revealed in us and being manifest out of us to the glory of the Father to live in the manner that the lamb we ate lives. To allow the life of the lamb to live in us as resurrection. See, but that's not just the lamb. That's the firstborn lamb, remember? It's the firstborn. It's the firstborn. It's how the Father wants us to let him go. It's the process. It is, um, I mean, it, be, it does become sobering when you realize that the Father has a view and we have a view. Religion has a view and then the Father has a view of his son. And the elder son never got it. He was vindictive and mean-spirited and critical 
The prodigal never got it. He was self-centered and didn't care who he, who he stepped on, including the father, as he went his way. But they were in the family. Right? And that's enough, right? No, it's not enough. Not for the father, see. L let's say this. Okay, what if it is enough for salvation? Well, then that's us just covering our rear again. Is it enough for the Father? Do we even really know for sure? I mean, do we know for sure what is in his heart for his son? We hear things, but have we looked into his face? Have we, when he's putting rings and doing stuff to us, do we read that as the grace of God or the Father seeing his son and hoping we'll see his heart toward us? Is everything just based on the grace of God? Or, or is, it based on, is it based on seeing past the circumstances and looking into his heart? All right, well, it's time for me to quit. And I realized that I bummed you all out. I hope, I hope we can get past being bummed out over things like this, where we get diligent. I hope we get serious. I hope it's not another sermon that, thank God, Randy doesn't preach anymore on Sundays and, you know, 20 minutes shots. I can, I can take that. I hope that our hearts are drawn out to him. This isn't about me. But it will, as long as the Spirit is bombarding me with these things, should I not say them? Should I not want them to be the breath and the life of this fellowship? So, I should never apologize for sharing Christ, but I find myself doing it a lot. So I ask if you are offended, forgive me. And if you are, uh, what does it say in Hebrews? You have become sluggish. That's not the, that's another translation. Dull of hearing, several different ways of putting it that we, we repent to the Lord, we, we renew, we, 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 you know, I mean, revive would be revival, but revival is not what we seek. We want to be revived with his life and to pursue him with all of our heart. Amen. Okay, so let's take a break.